So, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a pre uh, my name is Vangelis Cookies. I'll be talking to you about Cinefo. Cinefo, which is Greek for cloud, but okay, that's more or less a, a standard name, uh, name for a cloud uh, stack, is a complete cloud stack over Google Ganetti. Have you ever heard about Google Ganetti? Have you ever used Google Ganetti? If you heard about it, that's even better. If you haven't, we have a few introductory uh, things about it. And then there's a, an excellent talk tomorrow afternoon by Michele, who's a member of the Ganetti team, and you can uh, learn all about it. So, Cinefo is our cloud stack. We've written a thin cloud stack over Ganetti. Our motivation was a public cloud service that we've built and we've run since 2011. I work for the Greek uh, Research and Technology Network. It's the Greek uh, Research and Education Network. It's the ISP for Greek universities, essentially. We provide a public cloud service for researchers, for students, for professors, for the IT departments of interconnected institutions. The service has been in production since July 2011. It currently runs more than 5,500 virtual machines. It has more than 3,500 users. In total, we've spawned more than 160,000 VMs. We've spawned more than 44,000 virtual networks. This is, these are pretty good numbers. I mean, I don't know if, you're, uh, if you have experience with running a public cloud service, but these are pretty good numbers. The presentation is going to be about the software that we've written to support this cloud service, our experiences, and how you could perhaps benefit from this software. If there's anything you may want to ask, if there's something that doesn't make much sense, please feel free to interrupt me, ask a question, and we'll talk about it uh, at the spot, okay? So what were our choices in building the Okeanos service? We want to build an Amazon Web Services-like service. Provide compute capabilities, virtual machines, network capabilities, virtual Ethernet domains, storage capabilities, virtual volumes for these VMs. One important difference, which is not what most people expect from a cloud service, we wanted persistent VMs. VMs which would survive hardware failures. VMs which wouldn't be volatile, which would be there, which would live migrate between physical hosts, for example. Our clients would be um, the network operation center of, uh, of a university. They want to run their mail server on us. How can they do it if the VM disappears when a physical node goes down? How can you do it over commodity hardware? So production quality infrastructure as a service, everything we would write would be open source. Everything that we have written is open source right now. A super simple UI, our users are students and uh, researchers which, ha which don't actually have prior exposure to cloud technologies. How easy is, is it for them to build a virtual machine and work on it? And how can you do it? What kind of software is there? How can you combine uh, open source components to build that kind of service? Why is it difficult to build a cloud service? Because you need to be stable, you need to have persistent VMs. Many people will say that VMs in the cloud world are cattle. You've got a thousand cows, they go out in the field, they do whatever they do, then they bring milk for you. If one cow dies, then no you don't care because you'll get another cow and this cow will go in the field and bring you milk. But this requires the applications to be written in a very specific way. This puts all the weight on the shoulder of the application developer. Many people, when they start to use a cloud service, they expect their VM to be there. They expect their mail server to continue running if something happens to a physical node or to part of the data center. How can you do it? The VMs are pets. People love them, treat them, take care of them. They don't want them to die instantly. They, they, they care about them. They have feelings for them. So that's how we feel about the VMs as well. These pets should run over commodity hardware. You can't scale if you have to buy big storage arrays, which are single points of failure, if you have to buy big networking equipment. We wanted it to run 
on NAS commodity, uh, on NAS match commodity hardware as possible. Scalability, okay, the obvious uh, need. And manageability, how do you upgrade the infrastructure? How do you roll out upgrades? How do you upgrade the kernel? How do you upgrade the lower layers? Using Garnetti has helped, has helped us immensely in that regard. So how we did it and the components about which I'm going to be talking uh, for the next half an hour. We built our own cloud software, we call it Cinefo. This software runs over Google Ganetti. Ganetti is software for managing clusters of VMs. We use DRBD, a replicated storage solution over two nodes for managing the actual disks of the VMs. We also use Ceph and the, the, the object store of Ceph, or Eidos. The decision is up to the user. We will discuss about how uh, different workloads need different kinds of storage on the cloud. And we decided to implement the OpenStack APIs for our cloud platform. So if you have an OpenStack client, if you have a library that speaks the OpenStack APIs, you can actually come and talk to Cinefo. We don't share OpenStack code. We only implement the specification of the APIs. And we've tested our implementation against JClouds, for example, and it works. More about that later on. We support whatever virtualization Ganet supports. Yeah. Ganetti runs over you, over Zen and KVM. Our production. No, there's no preference there. I mean, you're not using one over the other. Or our production using KV, uses KVM. KVM. Uh, most of the things that we test, we test on KVM. Right. But the components we use, they've been tested over Zen as well. But we don't run Zen in production. That's, that's, yeah, that's what I was going to get. It's your, your KVM based. Yeah. But if you decide to deploy Cinefo for your own installation, if you decide to test it, you could even go with Zen if you feel that this has a very specific advantage for you. This is a graph of the number of virtual machines on the service since uh, when we went into production, which was uh, around August 2011. The service proved to be quite popular. The graph is a bit obsolete because the counting stops at April 2013. This is about 4,000 VMs. We're at about 5,500 VMs right now, which is a pretty big number. We run on about 200 physical nodes. Now, the question that comes to mind is, why not use a very well-known cloud software? I'm sure you've all heard of many well-known cloud softwares out there. OK. Uh, there are many reasons for that. I'd like to make a comparison between the best known software, OpenStack, and our approach. So in building the service, we recognized six distinct layers. All the way uh, at the lowest level is the hypervisor. The hypervisor manages a single VM. KVM creates a VM. Then there's the node layer, uh, some software that knows that there are many VMs on a single node. Then there's the cluster layer. There's some software that knows that there are many physical nodes, and there are VMs on these physical nodes, and they can migrate from node to node, and so on. Then there's the cloud layer that knows that there are many users, there is sharing, there are many clusters, uh, there are um, uh, relations among users, this kind of thing. Then there's the API specification, and then there's the UI. We believe there's a big difference in the mindset needed to implement the cluster and low layers and the cloud and upper layers. They're two different worlds. It's a different thing to manage virtual machines, to have to do locking, to do uh, migrations, to do process control, to do all these kind of things. And it's a different thing to implement cloud APIs, to do the web stuff, to do JSON, to do XML, to do uh, multiple concurrent processes, to do users, resource sharing, ACLs. You need different skill set, and in our approach, you need different code. We chose, yes? This is a CPU-oriented approach. 
you mean it's a computer oriented approach? Yeah, but you also said it's CPU, storage, and network. We followed a similar uh, approach for the storage part in the sense that we offloaded some very hard stuff to either hardware or to RADOS, for example, and then we implement the storage APIs in a much thinner, much easier to debug, much easier to deploy layer. I'll have more about that later. But yes, this is a compute-centric uh, approach. So we choose the OpenStack specifications, and we choose KVM for the low-level hypervisor. And then OpenStack kind of crosses this management barrier. And you have the same software, you have the same database holding data for all your VMs. And if you want to do migrations, you go right into this very specific database which holds data on uh, who's the owner of this VM and how many resources they, they have and uh, I don't know, uh, what kind of image this VM was created from and so on and so forth. These are two distinct things. You don't want the same kind of software for doing both of these things. You don't want to upgrade everything at once. How do you do that? What happens with your VMs when you do that? How do you uh, upgrade from uh, the Bexa release to the Cactus release to the Diablo release have worked? We have been able to, to, to keep VMs up and running since 2011. The same VMs have been running, well, apart from, let's say, power failures since 2011. We did database migrations for our software and distinct uh, migrations for the Gannett software. And this has kept our operations running smoothly. So at lower levels, you need software that does VM handling, VM management. And Gannett is great software for doing that and has been developed since 2006. So it's mature, it knows its work. The administrators can use it independently of our software. And our software implements the cloud layer and the user interface layer. That's the main idea of what we do. And it makes things much simpler. If something is buggy at the upper layers, the administrators don't care. The VMs are still up and running. They can immediately tell if the problem is Gannett based or CMFO based. Guess which kind of problems appear most frequently, but anyway. They can upgrade things separately. They can trust the low layer and they can experiment with the upper layer because the upper layer is a much faster changing layer. Cloud technologies evolve constantly. But they can have the trust that the VMs are going to be there and they're going to be up and running. So at this point, I'd like to do some live demonstration of the basic concepts of the software so that you know exactly what we're talking about later on when we go under the hood to discuss exactly how these things are implemented. OK? So. I have my virtual machine here. It's running Ubuntu. And this is a demo installation of the Cinefo software. I'm already logged in anyway. Let me log out. You can actually go right, uh, you can actually go there right now and have your own account and play with the system if you want to. So I'm logging into the system. And I'll go check out the storage part first. An important concept, which I didn't mention. Cinefo provides for unified handling of storage for files, images, snapshots, and eventually volumes. We'll discuss about how this happens later on. This is the storage service. I've got my containers here. I've got my directories here. This is all implemented over the OpenStack Swift API. This is a web-based client for the OpenStack Swift APIs, API plus custom extensions for sharing. OK, so I've got some nice images here. I can view them. It works. Right? And I can also share files. I can say. I want to add a new user. Uh, do I know any users? Let's add this user. OK, so this user has read-only access. Or I can also share it publicly and have a public link and have everybody who knows the link download the file. 
this same mechanism for sharing stuff I can use for images and snapshots because the images, the templates that VM get made from and the snapshots of VMs, they all get stored inside the same storage system. Files are being shared with me. And there is this user here, images at demo.cinefo.org, that shares big 13 gigabyte files with me. These are the actual images that VMs are being built from. And these are just files on my storage system. If I move to the VM part, this is a web-based client that implements the OpenStack, Nova, Cinder, and what else? Glance APIs, right? And I've got a VM running. I, this is a Windows 2008 VM. Uh, we're running Windows in production. Windows gets get Windows installation get customized uh, from start to finish. Uh, administrator password, uh, disk resizes, everything works. You're given a password. You can log into your VM instantly. So I'll go create a new machine. These options here are the images I can use to create this new machine. And these options here are the files I was seeing before, enhanced with metadata, like what icon can I use, and uh, what's the description of the image, and things like that. So I can go create a Debian VM, for example, a Wheezy VM, right? And I've got system images, which are images provided by the administrator. I've got my own images, which, which I can actually upload over the storage service which means I can use the syncing client that the storage service provides to only upload the differences of a previous image I may have uploaded. Imagine uploadi uploading 10 gigabyte images over your DSL line or over your cell phone connection. Have you ever tried uploading an image over such connection? How can it work? It does work because it only uploads the differences of some previous images you or other users may have uploaded. I'll talk more about it later on. These images are shared with me, nothing, and these images are public. And if I try to use the image that has been uploaded by another user, I'll get a big fat warning that, you know, this is untrusted, that you'd better know what you're doing. So I'll go create a Wheezy VM. The system asks me what kind of hardware configuration I'd like to have for my VM. And I also have a, sto uh, a choice of the storage layer. I can either do standard DRBD stuff. My data will be replicated on two physical nodes. Cinefo does not care about the storage layer. Cinefo uses whatever Gannett supports. Gannett supports multiple storage layers out of the box, right? Standard is DRBD. In this specific deployment, we've enabled local LVM-based storage. We've enabled block devices over RADOS, standard RBD. And we've enabled our own custom storage layer that can do very quick clones over files on the storage part itself. So the user uploads an image and no data get moved for VMs to be created. We use the exact same blocks if that's what the administrator wants to do. Let's create a standard VM. I can inject my SSH keys the infrastructure will take care, Cinefo will take care of injecting the keys inside the image. This will happen uh, in an isolated way because this is untrusted user data, image data. And the VM is being created. I've got initial password, that's it. Now the infrastructure will copy image data from the storage part to the actual disks, because this is the RBD. And this is going to be a long-running server. This is going to be a mail server. This is going to be a file server. So it makes sense for the user to ask for this kind of storage, right? What if it was, it's staying in the queue for a bit longer than it should do, anyway. What if it was a, a volatile VM? What if I wanted to start 10 or 20 VMs? It wouldn't make sense to create the DRBD VMs, right? It should start. I don't know why it's not starting. Anyway, 
I've got other nice views like this one here and it should start I don't know why it's not starting perhaps the system is a bit busy right now anyway let's move on and it will start networking we can do uh, current version private networks layer 2 networks multiple ways of using them how can you do a thousand or two thousand or five thousand virtual networks over physical infrastructure do you use a different VLAN for each user this can scale our very expensive Cisco Nexus switches cannot scale over three or four hundred VLANs over all trunk ports so how can we do it it's pluggable it's the Ganetti side we have pluggable implementations I'll talk more about that later and this has started so let's see what's going on it copied the image this took about 13 seconds and then it starts a special customization VM we can actually see it as it, ha as it happens to customize the VM and insert passwords and files and enable users and so on and the machine is up and running right so I can connect to it and see that everything works and this is my machine now let's create an archipelago machine this time I'll do a thin clone I'll provision the volume as a thin clone of an image nothing changes except that no image copying is actually going to take place the volume will be provisioned instantly and then customization is going to run starting image copy at 13 minutes 52 seconds three seconds later the image copy is finished why because no copy actually took place <coughs> and imagine doing that for 10 or 15 or 20 VMs actually you don't have to imagine because I have a demo from the command line that does exactly that <laughs> this is the user dashboard this is provided by the identity component we've got multiple identity uh, methods I'll talk more about them later uh, let's see how I can access the system I have a keystone URL essentially and I've got a token I'll use the command line client we call it Kamaki to list the servers I can have a is this visible? I'm not sure. Let me change it to something more appropriate. Um, is it any better? Okay. This is a list of the virtual hardware configurations I can have so I'll pick this one here which is a small archipelago machine one CPU 500 megabytes of RAM two giga 20 gigabytes of disk I'll have a look at the uh, images that are available for me to build VMs <coughs> I'll use this one a nice wheezy machine so I'll create um, ten machines from this same hardware configuration this image and I can even inject my SSH key
so I can log in afterward. And it doesn't work because I should have said server create. And Kamaki will take care of issuing VM creation requests. And I see that the web interface gets updated. I mean, we didn't even have enough time to see it happen. Anyway, VMs get created pretty fast. All, is all requests are issued in the queue. And even while machines are being initialized, other machines are running. This happened in like, what? five seconds. Machines are already running. I've created a virtual cluster of about 10 machines in what's one or two minutes over archipelago, over our custom storage infrastructure. And finally, three machines remain building, two machines remain building. Anyway, I'll destroy everything. Now, how does this all happen? And there's another demo we can run if we have the time from the development version of the software that can also do snapshots and then clone this snapshot into uh, a running VM. So how the, does this all happen? Ganetti manages VMs. Ganetti comes with support for multiple storage backends out of the box. It supports LVM, DRBD, local or shared files, let's say on NFS. It supports the RADOS block device. Our group has actually contributed this support to Ganetti. It supports the external storage interface. It supports the administrator to write a small set of custom scripts to manage any kind of external storage, area, uh, storage uh, array. This has also been contributed by us. <coughs> it's easy to integrate with Ganetti. There's a nice remote API over HTTP, and that's what Cinefo uses. That's the overall uh, view of the architecture. This is Cinefo on the cloud layer. The compute part manages multiple Ganetti clusters. The storage part has either an NFS or a RADOS backend, and these are pluggable, they are distinct drivers. So we've separated the cloud implementation from the lower level cluster implementation. And RADOS, for example, your question, takes care of managing the lower level objects and replicating them and so on. The administrator always has a side path to go manage the VMs and make sure everything is all right. Yes? Uh, knowing like uh, Gennady uses primary and secondaries for each of the nodes, did you do away with that? Uh, no, no, no. Everything works uh, as Gennady knows how to make it work. If you choose a DRBD backend for your VM, Ganetti will choose a primary and a secondary, and you can do all the replaced disks and whatever you may need to have the VM up and running. Our administrators go and manage the RBD from this side path every day, and we'll know anything about it as nodes go up and down. Our identity component, uh, you can log in with a standard username and password. It has LDAP integration. It has Shibboleth integration if you want to uh, federate, do federated logins. Uh, Google ID, LinkedIn, Facebook, third-party providers, we've written these as proof of concept, they work. We've actually enabled them for our demo infrastructure, you can go check them out. There's a single dashboard for users to view uh, quotas, their profile, enable or disable authentication methods and so on. Our compute component is a thin layer written in Python and Django over Google Ganetti, over multiple Google Ganetti clusters. All the networking implementation 
is a separate pluggable part that's implemented with scripts around Ganedi. We've tried, we've actually tested and run in production either virtual networks as distinct physical VLANs, virtual networks over a single VLAN with uh, filtering based on MAC addresses, that's a nice hack, and we've also integrated a custom VXLAN solution, again without Kiklaves, the compute part, knowing. It's all pluggable inside Ganeri. So the compute part, yes? You mean what the VTEP is, what the virtual time endpoint is? That's what where, I don't understand. Where does it sit? Is it, by, uh, it sits on the host. On the host. We've tested with a user space implementation. It was a more or less a proof of concept thing. And this runs on the hosts and it uses multicast to uh, control, to, to find out the, the, the virtual time endpoints. It uses multicast for, for endpoint <coughs> discovery. Other distribution is done by plugging. Yeah. Yeah, this implementation, yeah. No, we, we haven't run this in production. It's our own implementation, pluggable inside Ganeri. But I'm uh, talking about this to point how one can plug distinct implementations, the administrator can even write custom scripts, very easy stuff, to plug into Ganeti without the cloud layer or even Ganeti itself knowing. How do we interact with Ganeti? When new requests come, we issue them to Ganeti clusters. When things change on a Ganeti cluster, either our requests take effect or the administrators uh, manage the VMs, we are notified, Cinefo is notified, and all the way up to the user, information flows and the user can see the uh, effect of their uh, requests or of the administrator's requests. Our storage part, files, images, snapshots, everything is stored on the storage part. Everything goes on the storage part is chopped up in blocks of four megabytes and these blocks are content addressable. So we can do efficient partial file transfers on the client side. If everything is content addressable, the client can hash local data can ask for the creation of specific files on the server and the server only has to reply with the missing blocks, right? I mean, I want to create a 10 gigabyte file, I want to upload the 10 gigabyte file. I need it to uh, comprise these hashes. The server replies, I've got most of the file, I only miss this and this part. The client only uploads the missing parts. This happens with files and images. And this can happen in the opposite direction for downloading a snapshot, perhaps for an offsite backup or something. It's this part here, and the backend that stores the actual objects. We've got two drivers. One is an NFS-based driver, so you can use your existing infrastructure. One is a RADOS-based driver, so you can run over Ceph. Now, how does it all tie together with volumes and how do we do thin clones over such images? This is the image of a VM. It's a frozen uh, VM state. And then we spawn it into a VM and then the VM has a life of its own and then we can freeze it back into an own image. And this all comes down to storage. We've got a snapshot of a root disk and we clone it and then we can snapshot it back into uh, a frozen disk plus custom data. How does, does it all happen over commodity hardware? Why do that? Because I'm a researcher. I want to run a parallel application on 10 or 20 nodes. I can spawn all these nodes over a single golden image that I have created and uploaded, perhaps partially. These are the virtual disks of two VMs. And they are... Uh, they contain multiple blocks. Every disk is a linearly addressed set of blocks. 
how do I go from these blocks to my storage, whatever that may be? We've chosen to use RAIDOS in production, but this wasn't always the case. We used to run over NFS for a while because that, we felt, was more stable for us. What if you have some sort of other storage solution? How do you go from virtual disks to whatever storage solution you may have? We've written a custom layer. We call it Archipelago that maps from these blocks to individual objects on the storage layer. If it's NFS, it's files on NFS. If it's RAIDOS, it's objects on RAIDOS and you can migrate from one storage solution to another by migrating these objects without the VMs knowing. And the actual maps, the actual information of how these blocks are mapped to objects, it's also stored inside your storage part. This is a... Yes, please. The current code, I think, does not have support for this, but there's no design reason why not to do this. You could, yeah. So this is a more technical view of the whole thing. This is the compute part of the cloud. This is the storage part. This is the RADOS cluster, the monitors, and the RADOS storage nodes. The VMs and the... Uh, and the actual file contents, they are both stored as objects on RADOS. And the users can upload their image, have it become objects on RADOS, and then we thinly create the volumes that the VMs use. So that's more or less it. Archipelago is unified storage for files, images, and volumes being created from these images. And then we can snapshot a machine back into a file that the user can view, can download, can copy, can share, can do whatever uh, the user likes to do. This is the URL for the software. You can read documentation, you can download it, you can try it out if you want. Please provide any feedback if you actually do try it out. And another feature that's under development right now is snapshotting. So let's go see it work on another development installation. This is an installation of the development version of the software. It hasn't been released yet. I'll use two distinct accounts. One is my GRNet account, the other is my Gmail account to demonstrate snapshot sharing. I'll create a new virtual machine. This release has support both for images and snapshots. And again, snapshots are either system provided, my own, stuff that other people share with me, or public stuff. And because we have the same storage layer, we can reuse the same code, and we can use, reuse the same sharing mechanism. So I'll create a new Debian machine. I don't have to write down the password because I've already injected my SSH keys. The machine gets created almost instantly. It's done. So I will connect to it. And go do some sort of provided I can copy and paste properly. So I'll connect to it and I'll do some sort of customization. Say 
I'll go mess with the message of the day. And I'll say, this is a, I don't know, volume to be snapshotted. Welcome. Okay, that's my machine now. I've made some sort of custom change. I'll come back to the compute control panel and I'll create a snapshot of it. And this snapshot will have a name, it will have a description, like um, I want to share this with my GRNet account. I'm logged in with my Gmail account right now. It will have a nice name and that's it. The snapshot got created. Now, where does the snapshot live? The snapshot get created instantly because you just have to copy them up. The snapshot lives on the storage part. So I could go and sync it in a Dropbox-like manner. We have syncing clients. You put your own files, images, whatever, into Dropbox. You download your own snapshots. And this is the snapshot I just created. It must be this one. So I can go share it and reuse the same mechanism that we use for any other kind of file. And I share it with my other account. Now I log off the system, log in with my other account. and predictably go create a new VM. I had already tried this before, that's why there is a VM already. So, system snapshots, none. My own snapshots, one from a previous invocation, that's not the one that I just created. Shared with me, this is the one I want to use. There is a big fat warning, do not do this if you don't know what you're doing. It's shared by my Gmail account. I'll create the machine. And... When my machine is done... It's up in what was 14 seconds. I'll connect to it. Takes a while to boot. And this will be a clone of a machine snapshotted by a different user made from somebody who the snapshot got shared to. Or at least we hope that is what's going to happen. Okay. And the system shows that this is actually a clone created from a snapshot that another user shared with me. So that's more or less it. Uh, are there things you'd like to talk about? Are there things you'd like to ask? Please feel free to do so. If I install uh, Debian Linux and uh, put repositories uh, for installation of uh, uh, the software, then I will have fully functional software? Or we have an, an administrator's guide we have a quick installation guide on two nodes, for example. Yes, I, it's, I based on, it's based on Squeeze currently. Yes. We have the repositories, they contain Squeeze packages. We have step-to-step -step instructions for installing, verifying the operation, and eventually having your own compute and storage cloud in one or two nodes. And we also have a live uh, CD that you can download and run if you want to uh, test out the software instantly. It's all on cinefo.org. I, I think I showed the, yes, the URL in the place. Right? Yeah, so it should work. Oh, okay, 
And for everything that doesn't work, please contact our uh, support mailing list and tell us that it doesn't work. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned the persistent, uh, persistent VM uptime in case of failed nodes. Mm -hmm. It, key, it depends on the kind of migration that you do at the Gannett level. If you live migrate the VM before the physical node goes down, then nobody's ever going to notice anything, right? Because Gannett will take care of live migrating the VM to another node. The VM will keep all its state, will continue to run happily. Nothing ever happens. It may miss one or two packets over TCP or something. That's it. If the physical node goes down because you've pulled the power plug, then you cannot keep the state because there is no uh, known mechanism currently that you can run in production that will keep the CPU register synchronized among nodes. But then you can ask an to fail over the, no the VM to another node, so the VM will boot in a few minutes or something. There's actually some KVM patches to be able to live migrate uh, in the case of a failed node. So like with every instruction, it do I'd really like to see them because I can't imagine the kind of performance that running as a virtual CPU synchronized over the network. I mean, the RBD synchronized storage over the network, and it has quite some latency, right? I can't imagine live syncing CPU registers over the network. I mean, there have been research approaches, but I'm sure nothing like that runs production currently. It's pretty terrible. It's only for very lightweight things like DNS. Yeah. Any other question? Of course, of course, of course, of course. If you snapshot... And you need to know on which VM you must install also the patch. This is an infrastructure as a service cloud. So if you snapshot a virtual disk and then you create new virtual disks from it, there is no way one could synchronize the contents of virtual disks that have their own life with the contents of a, the original virtual disk. Because it's all blocks. I know nothing about the VMs. The infrastructure does not have any direct access inside the VMs. The infrastructure cannot SSH into the VMs. So there is no way we can propagate block changes on the original. There is no way we would like to propagate these kind of changes because that would break horribly. Exactly. Do you keep metadata? Of course, of course. And then you SSH into the nodes and you install stuff and you use Puppet and then you're happy. We've got, we've got software that's called Cinefo Image Creator that will analyze your system. Yeah. It will find out the distribution that you run and where your root file system is and what kind and of users have, you've had. Yeah, so if I make a snapshot of something with 40 gigs um, and somebody tries to make a new machine from that, which is only 20 gigs, is it going to work? This cannot work. Because we I know it can't work, but does, will, will Cinefo actually warn people? It won't, it won't allow you to create yeah, a right, virtual exactly. disk from a snapshot that's 40 gigabytes. Yeah, it will right. never truncate the disk. If the disk is bigger, if you have no metadata about the snapshot, it will just fill the first 20 gigabytes of data, let's say, and leave the rest empty. If you provide the metadata for the snapshot, if you say that this is the root file system and it's a Debian machine, then Cinefo will actually resize your disk so that it fills all the space. Yes, please. Do the uh, Gennetti clusters have any awareness of the uh, No, that's the good thing. Right, so Gannetti only knows about VMs. It knows nothing about users, nothing about the relations between VMs, nothing. So you can use any Gannetti management tool you like. We prefer the command line, but there are other graphical tools. Let's say Gannetti Web Manager. You can do whatever you like as an administrator to keep the VMs up and running. And it's all Gannetti stuff. Gannetti keeps its own state. It's not kept in our database. Right. It has its own state keeping mechanism and it takes care of synchronizing this state among master candidates, as they're called in Gannetti uh, speak. To, to add new 
it's super easy to scale linearly just by adding a net clusters. We're running about 15 clusters in production right now. If we had the hardware, that's our main problem right now, we could scale linearly to, let's say, 30 clusters. You just say, I want to add a new backend, you set up your cluster, that's it. Any other question? Does it support more than one cluster for Kinetic? We run 15 clusters in production right now. Okay. That's how we scale. And you can have distinct clusters with distinct performance or quality of service characteristics. You can route your users to, let's say, clusters that are SSD enabled or that run one core per VM or that do whatever else you may want to do. Cinef actually has logic for routing specific users to specific clusters. And it's interesting, I forgot to mention this, I should have mentioned this. Running Cinef in production combined with Ganetti, we were able to do rolling hardware and software upgrades. We upgraded kernels, we upgraded Ganetti itself, we upgraded Cinefo. The users didn't notice. I mean, they did notice when Cinefo was down, but that was just the control path. The VMs were still up and running. We did node evacuations. We do them all the time. We migrated VMs from data center to data center. We abused the Ganetti cluster to span both data centers at this point. And the VMs left Intel machines and found themselves on AMD machines on a different data center. We did on-the-fly migration from NFS storage to RADO storage because they're just objects that Archipelago manages. We renumbered all VMs. Imagine these kind of things happening on an OpenStack or other deployment. What kind of hacks you have to do in the database, for example. I've, I've heard a few horror stories. I've never actually run OpenStack myself in production. I'd like to hear more about your experiences with that. Maybe following up on that, I, I was talking to the rest of the team during the break. So, and I don't, uh, I'm on the OpenStack side, more mm -hmm. or less. Um, but I think that's a very interesting kind of zoom out question. Like how do these two frameworks compare? Of course. Do you have any clue? Do I have? Do you have any clue? How Cinefo would compare with OpenStack, yeah. you mean? Not Cinefo necessarily. Kind of the approach. I prefer the Ganetti approach because it's more self-contained. It does a simple thing, it does it more or less perfectly, it does what it promises. Then the rest is other people's problems and you can treat them separately. If you have a single software that spans everything from the hypervisor all the way to the user, it's much more difficult to, to manage. That's what our experience has been from evaluating OpenStack in the early days and now and running in production. But I hadn't actually run OpenStack in production, so we were too afraid to do so, essentially, but, yeah. And what I see about OpenStack in uh, these days, I didn't really know it before, is that it's much more modular than anything. So you can basically, theoretically, remove any part of the stack and substitute it with something else. Then it is, as David uh, said, it's more uh, self-contained. It's a single software for managing everything from the hypervisor but all these modules are around Ganetti, they're again self-contained, and they do a very specific thing. So if something breaks, you more or less know where to look. So how do you scale? You add new Ganetti clusters. Why is that good? Because you can have different network and storage backends for different workloads, and this choice goes all the way up to the user. And that's more or less it. If there's anything else you may want to ask, please find me after the talk and we can I'll discuss all about it. Thank you for being here. <laughs>